And here's the key about the Ten Commandments. Martin Luther, one of the greatest thinkers in the history of the world, he has phenomenally helpful insights on the Ten Commandments. He speaks of them in places like his Heidelberg Catechism. And he says, really, there are two commandments and then implications and applications of those two commandments. And the first two commandments are these, Martin Luther rightly says, and again, we're speaking from Jesus, who here mentions roughly half of the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is there's one God alone. The second commandment is you are to only worship that God alone. Martin Luther rightly ascertains if we obey the first two commandments, we will not disobey the rest. This is very important for how we do counseling at Mars Hill. We want to do counseling the way Jesus does it. Because were Jesus to walk into the office today of a behaviorally based moral psychologist, the counselor would ask him, so tell me about your life. Well, my business is going very well. I don't have any addictions. I don't have any sexual sin. I don't have any gambling problem. My health is good. I'm very rich and very powerful. The counselor would say, I don't think we need a follow-up appointment. You have a fantastic life. You have no addictions. You have no sinful, wicked, destructive proclivities, compulsions. You're not harming anyone. In fact, you should be the counselor. Because today, all we evaluate people based upon is their outward moral behavior. And if they're not behaving rightly, we want to change their behavior. And the issue here is Jesus isn't trying to change the man's behavior. He's trying to change the man's God. So it's far deeper. Yeah, the man doesn't have addictions and proclivities, but he worships the wrong God, which is a bigger problem. Here's how it plays in the Ten Commandments. If you commit adultery, your problem is not sexual. Your problem is that you're worshiping the wrong God. You're worshiping sex or pleasure or convenience. And as a result of worshiping the wrong God, you committed the worship act, idolatrous worship act of adultery. If you're someone who overeats and you're a glutton, your problem is not food and gluttony. Your problem is worship and idolatry. You worship food. When you're sad, you go to food for comfort. When you're happy, you go to food to rejoice. Uh, when you've done something good, you reward yourself with food. It's all worship act. And so food is idolatry. Your God is your stomach, Paul says in the New Testament. So you don't have a food problem. You don't have a refrigerator problem. You have a worship problem. You have an idol problem. See, if you worship God, you won't worship food. If you worship God, you won't worship sex. Again, if you lose your temper, you get violent, you're angry, mean-spirited, perhaps it even escalates into murder. You don't have an anger problem. You have a worship problem. Your issue may be control. Your issue may be selfishness. Your issue may be that you worship your anger. You feed it and stew on it. And through bitterness, you empower it. You could look at someone and say, we want to modify your behavior. So we're going to give you principles of anger management, which could be helpful. But then all we might do for you is change your idol. So, oh good, you don't worship anger anymore. Now you worship control. And because you now worship control, you don't lose your anger. Oh, this is so good. We've exchanged idols, but at least now we found an idol that the rest of us prefer. <laughs> and this is where John Calvin says rightly that the human heart is an idol factory. We'll give up one idol to get another idol, or we'll pick one idol to control our other idol. But at the end of the day, it's not about behavior modification. It's about worship alteration. That's what it's about. 